Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Welcome to Equipping Hour. I encourage you to take your seat. Get your Bibles ready. You can open them to Matthew 28. We'll be there in just a moment to those very familiar passages. We are in part two of a three-part series, Lord willing, on the life of William Carey. Uh, This is not a book review message or anything like that, although I definitely am promoting this book. Um, I heard Kyle uh, Frazee gave this to the graduating seniors. That was genius. Well done, Kyle. Um, It is written by S. Pierce Carey. He was the great-grandson, one of the great-grandsons of William Carey. And he wrote this biography in 1923. And it devoted 10 years of his life before that to research everything, to read notes, journals, letters, things like that. Carey, just to remind you, lived in 1761, grew up during the time of the Revolutionary War and watching his Great Britain lose the colonies. He spent the first 32 years of his life in rural England. Um, His wife, when they got married, in fact, when when she finally went with him on the ship, she had never seen the ocean. Her first time seeing it was when she got on the ship. She couldn't read when they were married. He taught her how to read. So he spent 32 years in rural England just as a, a poor man, poor shoemaker, taught school in the evenings because his church couldn't pay him enough. He lived in poverty, way below the poverty level. But he spent the last 40 years of his life in India. That's how long his term was, 40 years. Never came home on furlough. We call him, because of what God accomplished through him, we call him the father of modern missions. That's the one whose life we're looking at. He was a nobody from nowhere, with no influence. And that doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Because God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the King of the Great Commission, and He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And all we have to do is obey Him. But let's pray, and then we'll take a look at the next segment of His life today. Heavenly Father, thank You for precious servants of Yours, like William Carey whom you used in great ways, ways that went way beyond their abilities and their strengths, ways that were never um, hindered by their weaknesses. That is just so encouraging that as weak men and women, weak servants of yours, plagued with the flesh still, you plan to use us as we yield ourselves by your Spirit's strength to your word and obey you. Lord, give us fresh eyes to see this great man who is rejoicing in your presence and through his many crowns at your feet long ago. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for what we can learn from him. Lord, I pray that you would raise up countless more William Carey's so that those at the ends of the earth can hear the gospel, believe, be gathered into a local church, and then also themselves participate in this great commission until you come home and get us. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Open our eyes. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My goal, just to remind you of a few things here for this series, first is just to encourage a bunch of nobodies from nowhere with no influence, that's who we are, that God has a plan to use people like you and me. That's what he did with William Carey. My second goal is just to remind you that God is never at a disadvantage in this world. On the Great Commission, he is never at a disadvantage. Carrie's life was littered with what looks like to you and me countless disadvantages to usefulness. There's no way God could use a a guy like him in that place and those kinds of churches. It, It looks that way. And yet what God did was astounding. 
A third goal for me is to ignite or reignite your interest in your, or your curiosity about William Carey. Some of you have read his biography, you've told me, um, and it's time to read it again. The, when I saw this morning, there were still three copies over there on the book shelves. Um, so I want to reignite your interest or just ignite your curiosity in William Carey. Next to the Bible, that's my favorite book. Fourthly, I want to stir up some of you to surrender your life to Jesus for the Great Commission. Some of you need to go. I was at a missions conference. Finisterre was able to go and, and exhibit at um, a missions conference in L.A. And I even had a guy who was 48 years old come up and say, do you have an age limit? And I said, probably, but let's talk. Um, it, was, it was amazing that somebody that age wanted to take his family and he wanted to go. Um, it was astounding. Some of you need to surrender your life to Christ for the Great Commission at the ends of the earth to undertake what William Carey did to the glory of Christ and for the good of sinners. And finally, for the rest of us, I want to stir us up to passionately send more. To passionately send more. That you're you're in a really only two viable options. You're either a goer or you're a passionate sender. There is a third option we learned, and it's called a disobeyer. You either go or you stay and you send or you disobey God. So get into one of those two categories. And for those of you who don't go, you need to step up your passionate sending. Support, pray, give, sacrifice, encourage people who do want to go. And how should you listen to this series so that you get the most out of it? I, again, I, I just would encourage you, don't try to take notes on the details of the events of his life. I'm going to give you his four friends who stood with him. Don't write down their names. Don't remember their ages. Don't remember the places and the little villages where they had um, their meetings and things like that. That's not the point. But as I walk through the course of his life and ministry, I'll try to distill some lessons um, that we can learn from. And if you jot down anything, those lessons might be the items to key in on. And I put the lessons into five categories. I'm going to give them to you again here. You'll see them up on the screen. The first, as we just go through the life of William Carey, what stands out to me is the lesson of the undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. You're at Matthew 28. Look at verse 19 or verse 18. Jesus came up and he spoke to his disciples on that mountain in Galilee, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. The one who commands the church to go and make disciples of all the nations, including those nations that are at the ends of the earth, he does not lack authority and he doesn't lack power anywhere to get the church's missionaries everywhere. He doesn't lack power or authority anywhere to get our missionaries everywhere. On earth, for Jesus Christ, there is no place of disadvantage at all. Do you understand that? Including the very place that you live. And the setting that you live in. Go to Acts chapter 17. Just to remind you, we looked at these two passages last week. Acts chapter 17, Paul is in Athens. They've invited him, the philosophers have, to speak about what he is all about. And he says this in verse 26. And God made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth having determined their appointed times. So man is all over the face of the earth where he is during the time of human history that he is because of God. God did that. The one with all authority in heaven and on earth is the one who determined the time that you and I live in. That's why we live in 2023 and not 1723. Because God. And, verse 26... He is also the one who determined the boundaries of their habitation. God determined not just that you would live now, but he determined that you live here, where you do, and wherever it is that you go. He draws those boundary lines. In his providence, each missionary 
Each church lives in the times that God ordained for, uh, for them, and each of them dwells in the country and in the location where he ordained it to dwell. Therefore, wherever God puts you and your church in time and in location, it is under his authoritative providence, and it never ties his hands with you. That means who you are, where you are, when you are, and why you are is not a disadvantage for the king of the Great Commission. It's just not. The pile of disadvantages that you think might be stacked against you in regards to your usefulness to God or, or whatever in the Great Commission, that can seem overwhelming. Carrie and the churches that he was a part of, sending some, somebody to the ends of the earth, it seemed overwhelming to them. Surely they could not be expected to send a missionary to the ends of the earth. That's the way that they thought. Well, from whatever you are, from whatever you have, and from whatever you don't have, from wherever you live, just obey the Lord and go or send. He is only ever in the position of advantage all the time. So that's the first lesson we want to learn. The second lesson to learn in the life of William Carey is the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. Over and over throughout this biography of William Carey, you can see God's masterful arrangement of experiences and giftings and divine appointments that had William Carey on one path and one pathway only to the unreached people of India Everything that God was doing in Carrie's life moved towards India, even his earlier desire to go to Tahiti. That's where Carrie wanted to go. And even God used that to not send him to Tahiti, but to India. Everything of his desires, everything of divine appointments, every experience, all of it moved for, for God to get him exactly where he was going, where he wanted him. God knows how to create the pathway to get his choice servants to the unreached people at the ends of the earth. You might feel like you're meandering. You might be feel like you're walking in circles, but God is not with you. Kerry didn't know for some time that he would be a missionary, but it was unmistakable all along what God was doing. Third lesson is the undisputable characteristics of a useful life. This stands out so much. 2 Timothy 2, 21, we want to have lives that are useful to the master, Right? William Carey was a choice instrument in the hands of the king of the Great Commission the very moment he was converted at age 17. And we're going to look at many of those biblical traits and leadership lessons in his life that are essential, that can't be disputed as essential for usefulness. And the hope is that it will inspire you and me to press on in the pursuit of those same character qualities so that we can be more and more useful for Jesus Christ wherever he has us. Now, we're going to focus still mostly on those first three and the last two lessons uh, we just are not going to get to and probably till next week. And that's this fourth lesson, the undesirable missteps to learn from. Man, there is so much that went right with the life of William Carey. So much went right in the sending of William Carey. So much went right in the team that he eventually formed in Sarampore, India. So much went right in the work of his translation. The guy was a genius. The amount of wisdom that was applied, it was truly astounding. And it was astounding because they had a Bible and they believed what Acts said. And so, of course, things went right when you obey the word of God. And so they did that. That's at the foundation. But, but it requires more than that in missions to the ends of the earth. It takes wisdom in each generation in the times that God has determined for you to live in. It takes wisdom to know how to get from where you are currently to where you need to go. So, so much went right. And missteps were made by faithful pioneers. That's who they were. They were pioneers. Nobody had gone before them in this track the way that they were going. They were forging the pathway forward. And they had lots of wisdom. And they did so many things right. And they made mistakes. And we should learn from them. And we can learn from them. And the last lesson category is the unimaginable dilemmas that servants face. The unimaginable dilemmas that servants face. Pioneer missionaries like Carrie, they were put into dilemmas that you would never imagine. And they chose to step into dilemmas that you 
can't imagine. And in particular, as I mentioned last week, the, the most amazing dilemma that stands out to me is the cost to the missionaries' families is much higher than anything that we would care to accept and admit. In regards to taking the gospel to unreached language groups at the ends of the earth, it feels like you're put between two impossible choices. Either we go so that the unreached can be reached with the gospel, and some of our family members might die or suffer greatly, or we choose to stay home and be safe, and they never hear the gospel. You can feel caught between those two things. Which one do you want to choose? Kerry put himself and his family in a dilemma that is difficult to imagine. And I share this with you so that you'll be burdened by those who make that decision. You'll you'll carry their burden for them. You'll pray for them more. Those on the field who are in that dilemma, those who have to make decisions about what am I going to do with with my kids? They're increasingly, as they get older, they feel alone. They have no friends. Is this what God has for them? Do you want to be in that position? Probably you wouldn't choose that unless you were convinced God was moving you to do that. These are unimaginable dilemmas. Last week, we began our three-part series on William Carey's life, how God used a nobody from nowhere with no influence. So I'm going to leave those categories up for you. Every once in a while, we'll step down into the top three as we continue on this morning. And last week, we focused on William Carey's early life before he had ever had conclusive clarity about himself being a missionary. Before being a missionary, William Carey was a churchman. He was a pastor. And he was burdened by the church's call from Jesus in the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations, and especially the ones at the ends of the earth who had never heard of Jesus Christ. And today, what we're going to drill down in on are are truly the the stunning events surrounding Carrie's great efforts to prepare the very launch pad that he would be launched from. There wasn't a launch pad for him to get up onto so that he could be launched as a missionary. Let me illustrate to you this way. Imagine that you have an appointment on another continent with an important king. You have to get there. But there is no airport in your small little town that you live in for you to get on a plane and depart from. So you spend the next eight years of your life building an airport in your small little town so you can keep that appointment with a king on another continent. That's what William Carey had to do. He had to create the very environment out of which churches would send him. It didn't exist. That's what we're going to focus in on today. Carey had to make the case for missions to unreached peoples at the ends of the earth. He had to make that case to his friends. The one who yearned for preachers of the gospel to go to the faraway heathen, that was their word they used for unreached pagans, The very one who yearned for preachers to go far away was called first to cleanse and save Middle England rural churches. Why? Why was he called to do that? Why was God interested in that? So that the church, so that those churches could hold the privileged place in missions that Jesus Christ desires the church to have. Now, I suppose Kerry could have just gone off on his own and been uh, gone on his own apart from his churches to some unreached people somewhere without him. He could have become a lone ranger missionary and left behind him the sickly, distracted, and frankly, unconvinced churches. And by the way, that's what many missionaries do today and still are doing today. They're fed up with the fact that churches just don't think the way they should think about missions. And so these missionaries leave them in the dust and they go. But that option never crossed Carey's mind as a legitimate consideration. His efforts to strengthen the weak and sickly churches around him for the Great Commission, it was never about him. It was never about him. William Carey did not have a William Carey-centered view of missions. 
What did it matter in the long run for Christ's sake if Carrie got to the field, but the churches remained unprepared to participate in missions as God ordains? He longed to not just correct the churches that were weak, but he longed to awaken them, to catch again the missionary spirit of the apostles Peter and Paul to the Gentiles. And while doing all of that for eight years of his life, laboring for eight years in the rural, forgettable, flyover country of England, he never lost sight of the evangelism needed at the ends of the earth. It haunted his spirit every day. He could not shake loose the distress that he felt for the world's hundreds of millions at that time who were perishing. In the 1790s, he estimated that the population of the world was 730 million. Kerry was known to be teaching a geography lesson. He taught school in the evenings, and he would be teaching a geography lesson, and he would be moved to tears. And to get a more accurate grasp of the worldwide task of the church in the Great Commission, he took different colored leather, used different colored leather from shoes that were worn out, and he stitched them together, and he made a globe Because he wanted to see the world, he wanted to see the eternal consequences of not reaching every continent with the gospel. He had to see it somehow tangibly with his eyes. And the more that he did things like this over the period of eight years, the Bible throbbed with God's missionary purpose even more in his heart. It is said that his globe became his other Bible. That's the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. (laughs) That's the lesson. Kerry was not on the unmistakable pathway to the unreached because he loved different cultures and he loved different cultures' foods. He wasn't on that pathway to the unreached because he wasn't sure what else he should do in his life. He wasn't on that pathway because he just loved adventure. He wasn't on that pathway because he had a bad attitude toward the sleepiness and the slowness of the churches around him, and so he should just go. No, he was on that pathway to the unreached. Do you know why? Because there is no other pathway that God has for the church than that one. We take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We heard this definition of church given at the conference um, in the last couple of days. A church is this. A community of saved, baptized sinners taught by elders and deacons reaching out from wherever they are for which the call to go is a command, not a suggestion. That's our command, is to go to the nations. So why was William Carey so concerned about the unreached? Was he some kind of an odd Christian? No, he was a biblical Christian. He was a faithful Christian. The pathway to unreach was not merely a command for him individually, but is the command for the church, and it's not a suggestion. And he labored for eight years to help the church be faithful on it. It wasn't just about him. The church did not exist to grant William Carey all of his missionary dreams. There's an undisputable characteristic of a useful life here, and it's just the selflessness of this man the submissiveness of this man. And listen, when is your submission most tested? When you love the authority over you? When the authority over you is respectable? All the wives are saying, I've never seen anything like that in my marriage. When is your submission tested most? When you have flawed leadership over you. Kerry was submissive to the flawed church, the imperfect church. He put himself under it. He would not usurp them. Kerry didn't hesitate to surrender himself under the only entity that could send missionaries, but in his time was in no condition to do it. He submitted himself there and he worked on it. There's undeniable evidence here that God is never at a disadvantage either. Also, God did not have to choose. I love this. God was not in a conundrum in these rural churches in England. 
God did not have to choose, man, I either have to get this missionary to India or I've got to get these sleepy churches in England awakened to my great commission. Which one am I going to choose? God was not put at a disadvantage with one as he chose the other. God stepped into the heart of what appeared to be the most disadvantaged set of churches to work through them, and he proved his undeniable position of advantage as the king of the Great Commission, and he got both. He got his missionary in India, and he got churches ready to send missionaries. God can do far more than we know to ask or think. So let's drill down into Kerry's case to the churches for forming a missionary society. That's what they called it, a missionary society. Uh, Literally, it's just a sending agency. This all happened from about 1791 to 93. Carrie's about 31 years old. In about that two-year period of time, amazing, stunning events unfolded in such compressed manner, and Carrie was the epicenter of it all, making the case over and over again to his fellow churchmen that they had to take up the cause of missions to unreached peoples at the ends of the earth. He exercised tremendous leadership. The key churchmen in rural England, where he was a part of an association of Reformed Baptist churches, were these men. These are the four men that became the men that stood by him. John Ryland, age 39. He baptized Kerry 10 years prior to this. John Sutcliffe, age 40. Andrew Fuller, age 38. Samuel Pierce age 26, and Kerry was 31. Their ages ranged from 40 to 26. These are the men that Kerry had to convince first. And then the churches that they were all associated with, he had to convince them first. John Ryland wrote this in 1812 about William Kerry after William Kerry had been in India for almost 10 years. So he's reflecting back on when he met William Carey. He said this, I baptized a poor journeyman shoemaker, little thinking that before nine years would elapse, he would prove the first instrument of forming a society for sending missionaries from England to the heathen world, much less that later he would become a professor of languages in an oriental college in India and the translator of the scriptures into 11 different tongues as of 1812. Remember, he's got 20 more years to go, 24 more years, 30 years to go, 20 years to go, and he's got 25 more languages that he's going to learn. William Carey translated the Bible or portions of the Bible into 35 different languages himself. Carey was God's choice instrument to eventually persuade those Reformed Baptist churches of rural England that they must be committed to the Great Commission at the ends of the earth. And I want you to remember this. I'm going to point this out a couple of times here. Carey was not trying to make the case for evangelism of the unreached at the ends of the earth to churches that merely just were ignorant of the Great Commission. Oh, there's a Great Commission? I didn't know that. Oh, we should do that. That's not the condition of the churches that he was in. Hyper-Calvinism ruled the day amongst serious-minded, Bible-loving Christians. And the churches all had a settled conviction about the lost at the ends of the earth. They were stressing God's sovereignty, something that they loved, something that we love. They stressed God's sovereignty over the salvation of lost souls at the ends of the earth to such an extent that man's responsibility to go evaporated. And that's what happens anytime you take complementary doctrines and you exalt one and look at it so much so often without revisiting this that you just lose sight of this and it goes away and you forget about it. And that's what they did. Now there have been churches galore that have done it the other way too. Right? And the point is it's neither of those. Kerry could never square that in his mind because of Jesus' command to his disciples to go. So he started to form his arguments against those kinds of baseless positions. He was dealing with them all of the time. Here's an example of one of them. 
John Ryland, one of his friends, eight years older than William Carey, had young men gathered around him to, and, and said to them, hey, propose some topic for discussion. So can you imagine this? There's an older guy, and he's got his young pastor-trained guys sitting with him. And he says, somebody propose a topic, and let's debate it. Let's discuss it. William Carey stands up. And he says, how about the duty of Christians to attempt the spread of the gospel among the heathen nations? That's what he said. Ryland, astonished, springing to his feet, denounced the proposition with a frown and thundered out. Listen to what he said. Young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. John Ryland loved Jesus Christ. John Ryland loved the Bible. John Ryland loved the church. He sacrificed himself for the church. He overemphasized a good doctrine to the exclusion and diminishment of another. That's whom Carey had to convince. Andrew Fuller was sitting there, and he said he was startled by the boldness of Carey and the novelty of the proposal. Well, that's a novel idea that we should actually go to the end reached at the ends of the earth. Huh. That's whom he had to convince. And this went on and on until Carey began to write a pamphlet. He began to organize his thoughts and he titled his pamphlet. You're going to love their titles in their day. Here it is right here. This is how big his pamphlet was. The, the title is An Enquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. That's his title. An Enquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. Here's the backstory to this booklet. The Association of Baptist Churches in Rural England that Kerry was a part of, they gathered for Easter in 1791. Just think of the world at that time. I mean, how old are we as a country? <laughs> I mean, just think about what's going on with Great Britain. French Revolution. I mean, all this stuff. Here's, here's some nobodies from nowhere gathering, and they have no influence, and they're gathering together. This is two years before Kerry would ever leave for India. India's not on, even on their radar. He's not identified as their missionary yet. They're not even thinking about missions. And the association wasn't convinced at all that they should do any of that. Carrie's fellow pastors preached to each other and the delegates that came from the church, several sermons. And at the end, they were under conviction. They were like, we have been slothful. And Carrie appealed to them for action. It was not enough in his mind to merely be under the conviction that they hadn't done enough. They needed to act. They needed to tangibly respond. And so he pleaded with them, the biographer says, on Christ's behalf to become Christ's ambassadors to the world. And no one stood with Carey. No one. Here's what Carey's friend Andrew Fuller said. Feeling the difficulty of setting out on such an unbeaten path, our minds revolted at the idea of attempting it. That's how these good men felt about what Carey was trying to convince them of. Their minds revolted at it. It seemed much like grasping at an object utterly beyond our reach. That's what they felt like. And that's the undeniable evidence, the lesson that God is never at a disadvantage. Listen, they did not have authority in heaven on earth, personally, individually. They did not determine the times in which they lived in. They did not have much choice in the boundaries of their habitation. So, of course, it seemed like it was outside of the reach that they had. The question is not that. The question is, does Christ see it that way? From their perspective, from your perspective, it will always seem impossible to go to the unreached. So stop letting your perspective be the only one that influences your trembling heart. Feed your trembling heart the kingly authority of Jesus Christ. He's got authority everywhere. And he can get you anywhere. The Association, Association of Baptist Pastors met again one month later in May of 1791. And Carrie's friend Pierce said, hey, William, read part of that pamphlet you've been working on to us. And so here's the breakdown of this little pamphlet. 
the title first, you can tell that he's concerned about you, the means that need to be used. He talks about the obligations of Christians to use means to convert the heathen at the ends of the earth. So that's what his title emphasizes. Kerry firmly believed that the Bible clearly teaches not just that God is sovereign, but that he also uses means like churches and missionaries to save sinners at the ends of the earth. The introduction that William Carey writes, the biographer summarizes Carey's intro this way, not by deluge or flood, nor other such judgment will God deal with the world's sin. God calls people by the grace of Christ's cross. The apostles published it near and far as their Lord had commanded them. Cultured and barbarian peoples alike received it, and they were blessed. Zealous Christians of later centuries also published it, sometimes with great response, but never in vain. Now, in Carrie's day, Carrie said, only a few seem to care and obey. It is time for Christian people to awake from the love of money and ease, he said. Section one of his inquiry is the argument section. It contains the chief criticisms against the Great Commission uh, going to the heathen world that Carrie dealt with over and over and over. Here's what Carrie wrote in his inquiry. There seems also to be an opinion existing in the minds of some that because the apostles were extraordinary officers and they have no proper successors and because many things which were right for them to do would be utterly unwarrantable for us to do, therefore it may not be immediately binding on us to execute the great commission as it was for them. That was the logic going on. So some said only the apostles were to teach the nations. That was just given to the apostles. It's not given to us. Carey's response, his argument back was, well, if the command to teach all nations was restricted only to the apostles in Matthew 28, why is it okay for us to baptize? Do you understand what he just did? Wait till you hear this one. If teaching and going to the nations is not for us, as some argued, then the promise is also not for us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What have they done? They become very arbitrary about the different parts of the Great Commission. And they're very quick to reject the going and going to the nations and teaching them but they had no problem as Baptist baptizing. And they loved the promise that Jesus was with us. And Carrie says, you can't have one without having all of them. And if you're going to get rid of one, get rid of all of them. In the second section, Carrie's, is Carrie's review of the Great Commission, starting with Acts. I love it. He just walks through the book of Acts in this second section. Then he goes into the early church history, he goes to the reformers, he goes to missionaries like John Eliot and David Brainerd, who were missionaries among the American Indians. He highlights the Moravians. He highlights the Wesley brothers, whom he would have probably seen as a young boy evangelizing the countryside of rural England. They all went, and his argument was, why aren't we going? Section three is Carey's survey of the global task the scale of the task at hand in the Great Commission. For him, it was the message of the map. And he broke down the world into the four-continent view of his day. And the biographer says this about this section. The minute precision of information is almost extravagant. Islands, but two to three miles across, are not too trivial for Carrie's attention. Kerry estimated the populations and categorized them as Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or pagan. The biographer says his statistics were his griefs. To have to write pagan 99 times against vast and populous regions, and to have to write Muslim 53 times, it moved him to deep sorrow. He cared for people everywhere, not just in the South Seas. The ebb and flow of all men's hearts went through him as far as his map was concerned. Even pinpoint dottings on the oceans were precious in his sight. His interest in islands is most marked. 200 
He names either as individuals or clusters, partly out of exactness and partly because now his own hope was to make his missionary home on some strategic one of them. So by this time, he, he's so burdened, he has to go. 1791. And he is able to write down and make on a globe 200 islands in the South Pacific. His feet and his hands moved in Leicester. That was the village he was in. His heart was in Tahiti. His statistical findings were tragic. I told you earlier he estimated the world's population at 730 million. A shoemaker in rural England guesstimated the world population at 730 million in 1791. More than one-fifth of them were Muslim and more than one-half were pagans. That meant seven-ninths in all, either being Muslim or pagan in his day. Half of Asia, most of Africa, most of America, all but the coast of South America were lacking in civilization as much as they lacked in true religion, and the people sometimes were cannibal. In the inquiry, here's what Kerry wrote. This, as nearly as I can obtain information, is the state of the world. Here it is. It's the state of the world in 1791. I have therefore only calculated the extent and counted a certain number on an average upon a square mile. In some countries more and in others less, according to circumstances, as circumstances determine, it must undoubtedly strike every considerate mind what a vast proportion of the sons of men of Adam there are who yet remain in the most deplorable state of heathen darkness without any means of knowing the true God and utterly destitute of the knowledge of the gospel of Christ or of any means of obtaining it. In many of these countries, they have no written language, consequently no Bible." And that's the lesson of the unmistakable pathway to the unreached. Who does this? Who does this kind of thing? What shoemaker, teacher, pastor leads the world forward with a world population project? Who could possibly care that much about the population and the conditions of humans everywhere? Who? Christians. Christians care. We care. Why? Because the king of the Great Commission cares. Carey read his Bible and he was convinced the ends of the earth mattered. But this project of estimating the world's population and the spiritual condition of mankind everywhere was Carey's attempt to see in his own day what God already saw. The pathway to the unreached must be populated by men and women in churches that are convinced that in their day they have to see the world as Christ sees it. Carrie had his Bible, and it was all that he needed, but it burdened him. I have to know what, what the state of the world is in my day. That was section three. Section four addresses all of the challenges that are in front of the churches and missionaries if they choose to, over, to go to the ends of the earth. This is what they're going to have to overcome. Carrie confronts every obstacle of distance, barbarism, death, hunger, and language. Listen, in that day, slave traders got over the distance, and they got over the barbarism, and they got over death, and they got over hunger, and they got over language so that they could kidnap their fellow man and make a profit. If the slave traders could do that, cannot the church, cannot Christians go with a much nobler end with the gospel to the ends of the earth? And Carrie believed those men who do go, they had to be men of a different character than the men of the world. They had to be men of qualified character. In Carrie's mind, there was not in Scripture one set of character qualifications for pastors at home, and then over here for missionaries, no set of character qualifications. The New Testament teaches, and Carrie believed it wholeheartedly, that there are qualified character pastors who send, and then there are character qualified pastors who go. 
Now, on a team, you may have a variety of that, right? You may have pastorally qualified people and deacon-like people on a team. Here's what Kerry says about the missionaries that have to go in the inquiry. He says, the missionaries must be men of great piety, prudence, courage, and forbearance, of undoubted orthodoxy in their sentiments, and they must enter with all their heart into the spirit of their mission. They must be willing to leave all of the comforts of life behind them and to encounter all of the hardships of a torrid or frigid climate, an uncomfortable manner of living, and every other inconvenience that can can attend the undertaking. Their first business must be to gain some acquaintance with the language of the natives. Okay, now just think about this. He doesn't have others to look at as really a pattern. He's read some things, he's seen a little bit, but he doesn't have a lot to go off of. But he's already thinking about what it's gonna take if somebody goes. The first business must be to gain some acquaintance with the language of the natives and by all lawful means to endeavor to cultivate a friendship with them, and as soon as possible, let them know the errand for which they were sent. They must endeavor to convince them that it was their good alone which induced them to forsake their friends and all of the comforts of their native country. They must be very careful to not resent injuries which may be offered to them, nor to think highly of themselves so as to despise the poor heathens, And by those means lay then a foundation for their resentment or rejection of the gospel. They must take every opportunity of doing them good and laboring and traveling night and day. They must instruct, exhort, and rebuke with all long suffering and anxious desire for them. And above all, they must be instant in prayer for the effusion of the Holy Spirit upon the people of their charge. Let but missionaries of the above description engage the work, and we shall see that it is not impractical. Kerry just simply took God at his word. It takes the right kind of men, and it can be accomplished. The last section, section five of his inquiry, is the program. It's the so what part. How did Kerry expect his fellow pastors and Baptist churches to respond practically? This is what Kerry says in the inquiry. Suppose a company of serious Christians, ministers, and private persons were to form themselves into a society and make a number of rules respecting the regulation of the plan and the persons who are to be employed as missionaries, the means of defraying the expense, etc., etc. This society must consist of persons whose hearts are in the work, men of serious religion and possessing a spirit of perseverance. There must be a determination not to admit any person into the society who is not of this description. He is as equally concerned about their character qualification as a sending group as he is about the missionary's character. Because he knows it's going to depend on both of those kinds of sets of men. From such a society, Kerry says, a committee, a subcommittee might be appointed whose business it should be to procure all the information they could about the subject, to receive contributions, to inquire into the characters, the tempers, the abilities, and religious views of the missionaries, and also to provide them with necessities for their undertakings. They must also pay great attention to the views of those who undertake this work. I would therefore propose that such a society and committee should be formed amongst the particular Baptist denomination. This is what we should do, guys. And let's just highlight for a moment the undisputable characteristics of a useful life. The useful instrument of God's hand here was not just a man who understood the biblical text and that he could preach it. But he was also a man of leadership who could see from the actionless place that they stood, he could see all the way to a missionary engaging with heathens at the ends of the earth. He could see that. And he could... Envision the process step by step. This is what we must do. 
in our day. We live in the, the boundary lines of our habitation that God gave to us, and we live in this time that we do, and we sail by ships and not by airplanes. He didn't say that, but he knew that, and, and he, he knew that the one who had authority over all things in heaven and on earth was telling him to go, so he knew the Bible, but he also had the ability to see from point zero to point 100 and how to get there. Listen, a useful life for Christ can only begin with biblical fidelity, biblical faithfulness. But the ability to stand up among God's people in their time, in the boundary of their habitation, and influence them and persuade God's people to follow him into obedience of the scriptures, that is an uncommon useful life of leadership in God's people. And that was William Carey. And so that was Carey's argument to convince his fellow pastors and churches that they had to participate in the Great Commission at the ends of the earth. He published his pamphlet, he began to sell it, and his friends in the churches were not moved at all to do anything. About a year later, in May 1792, the Association of Baptist Churches gathered again in Nottingham. 17 pastors from the 24 churches presented to one another their reports and the conditions of their churches. Here's what is said. Some were in terrible dissensions. Some of the churches were in terrible dissensions, distress, deep depression, and they lamented their feebleness and their lethargy. Most were full of hope and were reviving and experiencing healed dissensions. So that's these little churches. Beyond the countryside, what what are Britons thinking about? Well, The French Revolution had destabilized Europe and the shipping channels. And within the British government, Wilberforce had, with others, brought through debate the death of slavery at the same time. So if anybody's thinking about everything, they're thinking about the concern of of the, the status and the safety and the stability of Europe. And look what we did. We just outlawed slavery. Nobody's looking to the rural countryside. Nobody outside the country gathering of nobodies from nowhere with no influence knew what God was about to do. At the gathering of mixed maturity of churches, William Carey preached what has since been called the deathless sermon. The sermon that seems to never die from one generation to another. The biographer says, It has been pointed out that no other sermon since Bible times has won such an enduring place as carries in the memory of the church. It's quoted more throughout history than any other sermon. The sermon was simple and it had two urgings from Carrie to the churches and for the pastors. Here's the first one. Expect great things from God. Expect great things from God. The second one, attempt great things for God. That's what has been quoted more often from any sermon in Christian history. I think it's sad that we probably, I don't know if any of you even know that today. Have you ever heard that? I think the deathless sermon died, sadly. So that's God in his greatness. Expect great things from God. And their human responsibility, attempt great things from God. Carry never let go of the sovereignty of God and the use of means, use of men and women. The biographer says the burden of his message was that the divine way out from failure and disgrace that they were in was a wider vision and a bolder program. He led them back to Galilee's mountain of the forgotten commission, and he laid its obligation on their consciences and heart. What was the effect? Of the deathless sermon, the biographer says, when they came to deliberate, the old feelings of doubt and hesitation predominated, and they were about to separate without any decisive result till Carey was in an agony of distress. He could not believe that his brother ministers and fellow delegates, after responsible deliberation, would once again have no faith to do anything As once more his colleagues quenched the spirit and made the great refusal, all the disappointments of God surged through him, turning to Andrew Fuller, one of his friends, gripping his arms. Carrie cried, Is there nothing again going to be done, sir? And that's when the first domino was knocked over. The biographer says, Fuller trembled in an instant under the desperate, heartbroken gesture. 
and then his own soul was stabbed awake. Once Fuller threw his inspired strength into the cause with Carrie, things changed and men yielded. Carrie alone was merely an enthusiast, the man with a bee in his bonnet. Him they could elude, but Carrie and Fuller could not be ignored. When Fuller pleaded for the reopening of the shelved business, they could not refuse him. Before they dispersed that Thursday afternoon, May 31, 1792, Carrie saw this motion passed by the churches, resolved that a plan be prepared for the next minister's meeting at Kettering, the village, for forming a Baptist society for propagating the gospel among the heathens. And that is the lesson again of the undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage. Here, 24 very forgettable little reformed Baptist churches, some struggling greatly, more awakening to the gospel with forgettable pastors, every single one of them poor, and all of them, except for Carrie, entrenched in a warped theology that convinced them to not go. All of them plotted something as big as the world. Why? Because that is how big the heart of our king is. Are we expecting great things of God? Are we attempting great things for God? Five months later, in October of 1792, the Association of Baptist Churches, they met in Kettering. They formed a missionary society, a missions agency that was made up of churches and pastors. They banded together, recognizing that on their own they could not and would never be able to uh, send missionaries to the ends of the earth on their own prior to this date. Individuals and groups did go, but no example like this had existed of churches banding together. And just like Carrie's title for his inquiry is long, here's the title of their, their society. The Particular Baptist Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Amongst the Heathen. And this is where the five men's lives become inextricably woven together. William Carey, age 31, Andrew Fuller, 38, John Sutcliffe, 40, John Ryland, 39, and Samuel Pierce, 26. From 40 to 26. The leaders were all comparatively young, the biographer says. Young men caught the vision. Young men took the initiative. And from that time on, they lived for the mission. Into the rush of its, deep, uh, its deepening river, every interest of their hearts was swept. Young men caught the vision, young men took the initiative, and as you'll see next time, young men made mistakes. Very costly ones. Together, the little band of nobody churches from nowhere, they pledged money. Bless their hearts. They pledged money. They had no money to actually put in a, on a table anywhere, but they pledged money. And as far as I can calculate from 1792 to 2022, when I did this a year ago, they pledged 1,500 U.S. dollars, the equivalent today of 1,500 U.S. dollars. They had no ability to actually give that amount to the society at the moment. World Missions was launched on a promise to give $1,500. Nobody's from nowhere with no money and no influence. It's amazing. The world, of course, did not take note of the insignificant little company of humble pastors gathered in a lean-to parlor in the village of Kettering. Kettering itself had no notion the next dawn that it had immortalized itself during the night, yet its line was to go throughout to the ends of the earth. One more time on the lesson of the undeniable evidence that God is never at a disadvantage, and we'll close with this. The one with all authority in heaven and on earth who determined the time and the limited boundary of these pastors in their churches, the king did not need the world to see what was happening. The, uh, the king did not need the world to understand what they were doing. The king did not need the world to agree with what they were going to do. The king did not need the world to respect his servants or favor them. The king did not need the world to help the king did not need the world's permission. God was only in the position of advantage 
and at no disadvantage, such that he needed help. And this is the case for us today. What our conditions around us look like, it doesn't really matter, Grace Bible Church. And it doesn't matter for you what you think, how many obstacles you think there are around you and disadvantages that you have uh, trying to get to the ends of the earth or being useful to God wherever it is that he has you. There are no, God's not, his hands are not tied. And what the world thinks and says doesn't really matter. What matters is that we trust our great king and we expect him to do great things. And so we, regardless of how things look, we attempt great things for God. Let's pray. Father, may we do that even just in our homes today and with our families and with those that you have sovereignly in your providence put around us and put us near. May we expect great things of you and may we attempt great things. And if you would be so pleased to raise up some more to go to the ends of the earth from Grace Bible Church, Lord, would you please do that? And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.